Welcome back to part two of the podcast. Um, yeah, hey, come on, come on, come on. I think we all agree that that will never happen. Um, that was a good first half. We're going to start the second half a wee bit differently. We've got Emily Capel here. He's good. Hey. Where can we find your works of art? Oh, uh, you can find it on my website which is www.emilycapel.com, one P, two R's. But I'm always in the uh, kick up the R's as well. I like Dave Thomas is really cool. And whereabouts do you sit at Rangers in? I sit in the JU block. Hey, anyone else from here? Yay. Anyone from G block? Yeah. Oh, God, this is awkward. <laughs> G. He's G. G. I'm JU. Yeah. This sounds like a really bad 70s show. <laughs> right, so Emily... What's, what's the song you're going to sing for us then? I wrote you lot a QPR song. <laughs> this is my third QPR song I've ever written. Because I am so, I just was saying that I'm, I call myself friends or soulmates with Joey Barton. Because, no, hang on, come on, guys. <laughs> because he, uh, he sent me a tweet and it was the best second best moment of my life after I met Mick Jones in the class who's also a oh, QPR fan right. and, uh, and so Joey sent me this tweet so I was like oh I'll write him a song so I did and it sort of backfired because he doesn't really want to doesn't really want to be my best mate anymore because it's a bit weird and then my friend Al had a 50th birthday and he made me write him a QPR song and then you guys asked me to come down so I've not even recycled I've literally gone from the top and written it again so brilliant and it's not uh it's not you know the referee referees or anchor or anything am i allowed to say that on the podcast i think you just did sorry david fraser swears far war the referee is a big poo thank you no i think you're right the first time okay <laughs> can we have a big round of applause for emily for coming down and singing the song first of all i would always come down walk away yeah Okay. I am a QPR fan. I was even a junior R. We had the championships and the playoffs, and we had Bobby Zamora. But things got pretty boozed up for us when we had Harry Redknapp Sawney. And it felt like it was over when we lost Charlie. It was pretty awful to watch as we had the Premier League unfold, especially with the lack of leg room we've got at Loftus Road. <laughs> and I won't ask for my money back, not with Jimmy Void Hasselbank, because West London is who we are. We're the super hoops. We're QPR. <laughs> Oh, Clin Hill, you're such a thrill. I really love it when you kiss your badge and lead us out on the field and in the loft. We love you lots. But Jimmy, start with Washington, because I think he could take us up. There's only one decent German out there. But Sebastian Poulter needs to sort out his hair I do miss Joey Now there's Carl Henry on the ball And when it goes past him At least we've got Grant Hall Oh Cherry Cherry baby How could I forget ya If he keeps scoring he'll take us up And we could be the next Leicester Adam Anua I'll never boo ya But stop putting the ball in the back of our net Where's Butterfingers Green gone? Has he left with the blue and the white hoops? The only West London club, and we say F you, Chelsea, because the R's are going up. <laughs> Personally, from my point of view, I would have preferred if you said fuck you, Chelsea. But oh. didn't <laughs> well done. Thank you so much for coming down and doing that. Any, Seriously. Anytime, Hi, obviously. Hi, Thank you.
Make that your ringtone. Give us a couple of minutes whilst we move everyone else around. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. I, this is really bad. I forgot a, a, a thank you, and my mum will kill me if I don't say it. I forgot to thank my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> who do quite a lot for the podcast. So, so Ben and Richard, who does all the web stuff and all that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, then. Thank you, Emily. And... Okay, so this is part two of part two of the QPR podcast. First of all, another round of applause for Emily and her song there. And we're now joined in the second part by massive, massive fans' favourite. No exaggeration to say that. Played with distinction for the club um, over three different spells, over... Uh, I don't know what it was, ten, uh, five, seven years, something like that, but also a massive QPR fan. Um, give it up, everybody, for Lee Cook. Okay, first question, very serious question, this. Uh, your hair. Yeah. Um, back in those days, I thought you were a natural blonde, no. um, but clearly you're not. No, I'm not. I've always been dark. So, so why, why explain that? You did explain this to me earlier. But why the hair dye back in the but, day? Uh, one, well, two words. David Beckham. David Beckham. You wanted to look like David. Yeah, I thought I was. I thought I was David Beckham. <laughs> yeah. I was left footed and he was right footed. But and that's why I used to cross the ball a lot. I used to like the way I used to whip it in. So I thought I'd get the same haircut, same football boots. Do you so know what? I tried I, to copy I, his I, technique. And um, yeah, a bit of a bit of a minge really for doing that. But, <laughs> no man. Lee, to be fair, I did the same thing with Martin O'Neill. It didn't work out so well. Uh, Lee, you are still playing, or you were still playing for, yeah. for Eastleigh. Yeah, I've still been playing the last couple of years. I was at Barnet last year and Eastleigh this season. Still seeing it out, so I've got about a year left, I imagine. And well, uh, given that you're still playing. Is, do you still look for the QPR result at 10 to 5 on a Saturday? Yeah. Is, is, it, is it the first result that you look for? I've got down three times this year when I've not had a game or it's been a midweek game I could shoot down to. I'm coming down this Saturday. Obviously, my season's finished now. So um, if anyone wants a Jaeger bomb, go in the crown and set to about three <laughs> o'clock. I'll be in there. Drinks are on you. And for the, from those three, appear, three games that you've seen and probably a handful on the telly, what's your verdict? On the season? Um, well, I think Emily summed up quite well in the song, really. I thought I was, thought I was bang on the money. But, no, seriously, I watched the three games. I think the best one I came to was Ipswich at home, uh, which I thought we actually played really well there. Um, and I thought after that, things would get better. Um, but they didn't seem to. Uh, I don't really blame that on the manager. I think it's going to be a long process for him to, to turn this around. And I think we've got to give him time. If you were the manager, what, would you, what, what things would you put in place for the start of next season? Well, well obviously there's going to be a massive clear out, that's, that's for sure. Um, a big turnaround the players. And I think it's the, the type of player that we're going to bring in is going to be the important factor. And I think he's, he's the right manager that's going to bring the right players in. Um, obviously, he, he draws respect because of what he's done in the game and who he is. So I think whoever he signs, the players are going to respect him straight away. Um, but obviously the transfer market this summer is going to be huge for us, massive. Um, how, how much of a difference does that make when you have um, like a manager like Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank like for players or, you know, I mean, do, do players like join clubs because of the manager a lot? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, obviously, when we signed Connor Washington, he, he, being a forward, I imagine he was double excited to sign bit with him being the manager because you can learn so much of, off of them. And I've seen, him, I've seen him at work, Hasselbank. I was up at Forest for two weeks and I was really impressed with him. And McLaren fought a lot of him as well. And um, I just think he needs time because he's kind of inherited a, a bad sort of team where the team morale's not great and you can just tell it's not good. He needs time to turn it around and I think he's the right man to do it. Um, just quickly saying, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those who aren't here, we've just been joined by Kevin Gallen. <laughs> Hello, mate. Right. So you two together, uh, when you play together, 
a lot of people go on about Leicester's team spirit and how that's carried them over the line this season. For me, as a, uh, as a fan, that seemed to be the tame, same team spirit that was in evidence when you two played. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, I think the first season I joined was when uh, Kevin, the boys, got promoted up into the Championship. Uh, we came 11th. Um, the highest paid player was you know, not, not on much at all. We probably had the lowest budget in the division. Um, and we finished 11th. And at one stage, we were third, I think, after 25, 26 games. And it was, it was a tight team spirit. And I think that was mainly the reason we were there. Because we can't, the quality, we, we were lacking a little bit in certain places. And we fizzled out in the end. But for us to finish 11th that season, first season in the championship in a while. And um, I think that was mainly down to the spirit. No, definitely. Um, the spirit over the, those 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 few years was was really good. It was, you know, um, what Ian Holloway did. He, he he created a good spirit. But what he did, he was very um, very smart in his recruitment and bringing players in the right sort of the right sort of type. And uh, I remember the first sort of day when I came back for, from uh, when I got signed back again. He, he actually pulled me. He said, "Kevin, there's sort of there's a bit of a click going on. There's there's two sides." He said, "Don't get involved in either. Just be down the middle and just try and bring the other lads with you." There was sort of a younger, a younger uh, group and an older group, and they weren't getting on that great. And he said, "Don't, don't. We need to get this sorted." So, over those few years, and obviously the promotion team was, uh, you know. The year before, even the playoff, the playoff, and unfortunately we didn't win. But those sort of few months from like, I think it was maybe February to the end of the season, we we really were really good, and we were winning games. And then we sort of carried it on. To, and Cookie joined that summer, and we carried it on. And at one stage, I, I remember we we played. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about it today, but when we played Stoke. I was fortunate to score, yeah. and the Birchie got um, yeah. Jerry Taggart sent, sent off, yeah. and uh, <laughs> he, always, he always denies it. But I always remember that uh, going in the ch- going in at half time, he was waiting. Akinbai, he was waiting. They had Gift and No Williams. Gift and No waiting. Williams. They had like yeah. we had some big lads. They had some real big lads. We had a couple. We I think we had Clark and um, me, Curran. And- <laughs> We had uh, Curo, uh, Rosie, and uh, and Lee, and Rolands. So I just remember going in that, going in the tunnel, and just pushing Danny Shitter. Go, go on, Dan. <laughs> go on. So uh, I remember poor Rosie got gripped up against the wall, and I remember yeah. that because. <laughs> it, we, it was a massive rumble, wasn't it? Yeah, Do you remember? it was a big rumble. It was a big yeah. rumble just before we got into the... You, you had to go walk right down to the corner. But if you've ever been to Stoke, it's not at the halfway line. It's down nearby the away end. And they were all waiting for us. Jerry Tank, I mean, Jerry Tank was the absolute unit. I was, <laughs> I was shitting myself just looking at it. I was like, oh, God. And so I remember it, and I walked in, and Ian Holloway went, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? And then we went... We're just fucking sticking up for ourselves, and he went, "Yeah, fucking brilliant." <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and, I, and then I remember walking out with Birchy as we're coming out for the second half, and Jerry Taggart's now came out. Of the, we had to walk past their, their change room, and Jerry Taggart's now got a towel around him, and the shoulders are like you wouldn't believe. And he's like, he's saying to Birchy, "You're a mark man. You're a mark man." <laughs> And I looked at Bertie and went, oh, my God, you're getting it. And <laughs> How scared was he, though? He, oh, proper, he was proper, proper and he went off, up, and Bertie was such a went, pussy that I day. Did, <laughs> he, I and he anything. was like, no, I was having him, I was having yeah. him. No, and he went, I didn't do anything. I went, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting involved with him. <laughs> and we ended up winning uh, 1-0. Yeah. And we went, I think we went joint. We went, we went seven first. on the spin, I think. It yeah, was. and we were jumping about because our bonuses that yeah, yeah we our bonuses were were quite good yeah. if you got into the top two, and we got yeah, in the top, got two in top two for two. A, and we were just jumping about about yeah we got the bonus we top two yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now but like Cookie said it was um good team really good team spirit good lads all pulling together and and he's right we we finished eleventh we sort of we were like third or whatever but we ran out of steam because our subs bench weren't as good as the other teams. And if you haven't got people get injured, people lose form. And if you ain't got any others coming in to replace and to just to keep it going, you suffer. 
but it was a good season in the end. That that period, the kind of early two thousands, you know, for that sort of uh, four or five years, we've had a lot of players from that team and era on the podcast. You two have been kind enough to join us a couple of times, and Gino Padula and Chris Day and various others. There really seems to be almost like a glue that kind of binds all of you, and that there was an incredible team spirit. Describe what that was to us, and is that the kind of tightest group of lads that you've been with in, in your careers in football? Yeah, I think so. We just got on so well, didn't we? We socialised quite a lot together. Um, we'd often, we, Ollie used to make sure we'd have one team bonding session a month where we'd either go go karting and then go out drinking together. And I don't really think you get that in, anymore not these at the days. same time. <laughs> no, not at the same time, no. But yeah, we used to do it once a month, and we used to have a great laugh, didn't we? Even when the new players come in, I remember when Steve Lomas signed and the first, he, he wasn't quiet, but I mean the first night out he got a few Guinnesses down his throat and then we was like, blimey, how lively is he? And then after that, it, it was a different man. It was, just, yeah, it's just, so, it was like <laughs> coming to training and I think he was still drunk when he came yeah. in. Yeah. No, no, we, we sort of, I remember Ian Holloway got a committee. It was, um, at the time, I think I, I was captain, it was me. And then it was like another older player and then a younger player. So sort of, and we sort of said, look, we need to get every Tuesday, once a month or once every six weeks, like we said, try and get something, bowl it, whatever, a night out. And, and, it, and it sort of worked. And even if we had a bad time, we always sort of thought to us, well, we never lose after a night out. It was one yeah. of those. We ne- we've never lost after a night out. So if we went through a little sticky patch, let's have a night out. That will sort it all out. <laughs> 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 no, but it was good. Uh, Ian, Ian was, uh, he was very good for team spirit. Uh, yeah. He was very bubbly. Obviously, everyone knows that. And, um, but the lads would like good. And that's why I said he was very good in bringing in the right sort of player who would sort of not only uh, try and improve on the pitch, but... It's very important to bring the right player into the into the dressing room. I've been in dressing rooms before, and you bring one bad one bad egg in, and that's, mm. this is not at QPR. This is just general in, in, in when I was playing football. One bad player, one bad egg, and it's not even about being a bad player. One bad egg egg can bring a few with him, and then it all goes. But it surely can also don't ev- doesn't everyone else turn on the bad egg? Uh, or well, is it not that simple? No, you do, and you just sort of try and ignore him, but. Once you, once, well, that's Jerry Taggart. Once you, uh, yeah, once you, once you get a few with him, it's, it's difficult to stop. But hey, you know, so this, this happens. This happens in football. But back, back to the question. Great lads, great team spirit, and like you said, we weren't on massive money. And when you're sort of hungry to sort of do well and and improve, and the manager was very sort of keen on on telling you to get better, to get better, get better. You know, we had a lot of meetings, sometimes too many meetings about yeah. talking. We always had that joke, well, we've got a meeting. What about a meeting? Yeah. <laughs> it's like we have, we, Ian Holloway loved a meeting. It was like sometimes we would actually think, we've got another meeting, what are we having a meeting about? But it always, would always end it on like something funny or a high yeah. where you all laugh when you're coming out. Then he was happy to go onto the training pitch then. He was quite clever in what he did. Yeah. You know what he was doing? Very serious and then he'd end it being the Ollie that, you know, the fancy and stuff, but you know that's that's where he's, he's very clever. His man management and the way he used to get the team and manage the team together, get the spirit going. Even not just the players, all the staff, they all loved him, and you wanted to work and play for him. Kevin, you mentioned that um, Ollie kind of said to you to try and get everyone together uh, for team spirit when you were there. Um, do you think that's important for this season and the current team? Do you think there's anyone at the club can? Perform? who can perform that role or is it or was it a case of getting those kind of characters in well i think you have to do your homework when you when you're buying players if, if they're the right character that's that's a definite and there should be i'm sure there's background checks on on everyone because it's nothing new when you're working at a football club in recruitment whatever the first thing people say what's he like as a bloke now if they everyone says no nah, he's don't touch him he's a bad bloke then it's usually it's a no-no but going forward as uh, QPR, yeah, definitely, definitely have to, um, definitely have to do background checks. And at the end of the day, you can be quiet off the pitch and not really socialise, and that's not a problem. It doesn't matter as long as you're doing the business on the pitch and you work for your team and your team teammates respect you on the pitch. Because if you don't respect your teammates on the pitch, you won't go out drinking with them off the pitch, or go bowling, or want to be with them. 
Right, a, a question for both of you separately. Lee, what's your favourite QPR game and the reason for that? Uh, my favourite QPR game was my debut. Um, it happened to be against Brentford, which was a good one to have at, at home. Full house. We went derbies then. Um, I remember when I come in because I, uh, Ollie was... They were talking about sacking him. We just lost to Vauxhall Motors, I think, in the FA Cup. And oh, the whole room goes Yeah, no, like, I had a call and I, I, was at, I was still at Watford and they called me on Thursday and um, Ray Luton called me in and was like, look, I don't know if he's going to be manager, but they've come in for you on loan. Like, I know it's your club. Do you want to go? And I was like, well, of course I want to go. He was like, well, I'll, I'll get a recall like, thingy on you because I'm not sure what's going to happen there sort of thing. And then the next game was the Brentford game and we drew that game and I, we played quite well, actually. Yeah, we and then after then we we picked up a little bit, and then he was fine. And then from then on it it was it was it was you know a decent season. We got to the final of the playoffs in the end. And unfortunately for me, he used that callback clause, and I had to go back. Um, so I missed the, the playoffs. But yeah, I mean since since that day, Brentford at home. I mean all my family came. My, my dad was dad tears, granddad had tears. It was just a big day for for my family really. And Kevin, as as a Rangers fan as a child. Um, What's it like? See, so the thing is, we'll never experience that, all of us here in this, your league, Cougar Kevin Gallen. But to support the club and actually walk out with that shirt on, how much pride did you feel at that time? There's actually been so many games that I can look back on playing for QPR and thinking, well, that was a good one, that was a good one. And everyone will say, have their different opinion playing at. I mean, I was so fortunate to make my debut at Old Trafford, that everyone knows that was just a massive moment. The Sheffield Wednesday game, um, the Chelsea at home, just there's just so just so many. I can't really pick one out. So, but I, I can't really answer that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, a question I asked Lee Hughes as well. I mean, we've all seen what Leicester have done this season. Breath of fresh air, I think, for football in general. Could you ever see that happening to Rangers if we get our act together? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think rapping again anywhere. Right. I think that. So, yeah, I think you're right. It could be a one-off. Yeah, I think it's a one-off. But so I mean, that, it's a similar size club, if you like, and 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 I mean, I think every every club their size is thinking, God, if only we got this player. And that maybe if only uh, you know we hadn't let one of our players go to Leicester, that might have helped. But, um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> but I mean, I, I think what they've done well is. They've, they've, they've signed some really good players. I mean, if you if anyone thinks they just signed Vardy, yeah. that he was no one. Everyone in the championship at that stage was after Jamie Vardy. They were. I remember my brother Joe was at Millwall, and they weren't playing that weekend. The international, and he said, "Where?" I said, "Where are you going?" He goes, "I'm going to Fleetwood to watch this player." He came back, said to Millwall, "Sign him." They didn't have the money. Leicester. Fortunately for them, they had the money and it's been a success. But the signing of Mares, the signing of Kante is just, that's just unbelievable signings. And whoever is in charge of their head of recruitment has to take a mass, and the manager at the time who signed them has to take a massive round of applause because those signings have just been fantastic. They've rode their luck. They haven't had that many injuries, but people, will, they'll say, well, we've managed them so well. Our physio department and our fitness department is that good. Like I keep hearing that the Tottenham manager trains them twice a day and Ranieri's giving them two days two days off a week. And there were stories in the, um, in February, March when there was International Weekend, he's giving them twelve a week off, ten days off. It's worked. So Is that I mean, treating players as grown ups, does that does that work? Mm -hmm. Oh definitely. I mean the last thing I remember Jerry Francis oh, my first trip to Sweden yeah, pre season nineteen ninety four, Jerry Francis said Lads, you can go out whenever you want. Not a problem. Do what you want, do what you want. But I'm just letting you know, at 8 o'clock in the morning, in that 30 degree heat, I'm running your bollocks off. <laughs> so when you wanted that extra drink, you're like thinking, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. Because he'd put you on the line and you'd suffer. So, and he'd know. So he, he treated us like men. And same with most good managers, they treat you like men. And w when you get treated like that, you don't take the mick. Seeing as we're asking a non-QPR question, I'm going to jump in with another slight non-QPR question and about managers. England, the summer, Lee, if I'm not mistaken, you played under Roy Hodgson. Yes. So give us what, what, tell us briefly what's he like as a manager and, what, and how do you think the England players will respond to him in the tournament? Sorry, Paul, 
the Northern Ireland fan? Um, well, I don't think the England players have responded to him um, yet. I mean, we, we seem to in qualifiers be the best team ever, but we're playing a load of pony. <laughs> and the second, the second we play anyone good, then we we see what you know what it's all about. Um, you know, for me, when I played with him, I was with him for six months, training with him every day, and his training was quite boring. It was it was pattern of play every day <laughs> against no one, um, and a few players weren't having him. But he, he, there's there's nothing you can't. His record speaks for itself. Wherever he's gone, he's done well. So he's the England manager. Um, but the Euros coming up, I'm I'm not excited about them whatsoever. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, to I'm be being honest. honest. If I'm being, I'm being totally <laughs> yeah. honest. Can I just say something? As long as he plays Vardy up front with Kane, I'm happy. If we, if, if we qualify, by the way, we get England in the um, next round. So um, I'm, I'm quite hopeful then. Don't think we need to worry about that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I forgot you were going, to be honest. Um, oh, that's harsh, oh, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> We'll throw the questions open to the floor in one second. I wanted to ask you both a question about each other. In your own ways, you are QPR legends for things that you've done. Lee, of course, on the pitch, but you're best known for... not Sorry, not best known, but your gesture yeah. of giving back your signing-on fee has kind of given you legendary status and what you did for the club. Kevin... You're a QPR fan. I believe only eight players, eight QPR players, played more times for the club than you. I think only a handful of players scored more goals than you. Four or five players scored more goals than you. So you're both legends in your own way. Lee, for, those, for the people that are listening, because we've got a lot of young fans and you haven't played for several years, I want to know what you think about each other as players. And <laughs> <laughs> This could get really awkward. And like describe kind of, you know, the types of players... Each, each one is so Lee Kevin Lee on Kevin first well Kevin's a few years older than me as you can <laughs> tell so I used to go and watch him uh, when I was about 15 and obviously he was one of, he was one of my favourite players actually so he was like when I first signed for Rangers um, and I trained the first day I remember ringing my dad up and talking about training with Kev um, and about how good I thought he was and he, sat, he actually is as good as what we thought he was um, he's a bit slower than what he was when we used to come watch him <laughs> but obviously his touch and the, his finishing was, was great to watch especially training days that's when you see players at their, their best really because you're training every, in every day and you see him in different types of games finishing and shooting little games and you know watching him finish the ball his touch it's just a joy to play with because as a, as a wide player you need a decent number 10 centre forward to play to bounce off and I knew whenever I'd given the ball, I was going to get it back. You know, as I've dropped further down since I turned 30 and dropped down, that's when you notice the difference when you play with not very good quality. Mm -hmm. Unlike Kev, you don't get the ball back. And then you might think you've had a quiet game, but really it's because you're not playing with the like, players like Kev that make you look, make you look better. And Kev, this is what do you think of Lee? <laughs> 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 He's shaking his hand there. No, I... I remember Lee came and I remember the, 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 your um, debut against Brentford because you put a cross in and Birch, you scored a header. That's right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, but Lee, you came and then what, what, when did you, I know you said you'd leave, I can't remember because I sort of remember you left and then yeah. we brought in Kevin McLeod straight yeah. away, yeah. which you'd done really well for that for, for mm. a few seasons. But then when you came back that summer when we got promoted, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. He, he was like totally different because he, when he first came, he was, he was a skinny, little bit skinny, yeah, a bit and, like, didn't have much power, but he had the skill. He came back and he was stronger and he was a lot better. And literally every season he got better and better and better. And you sort of like, like he said, any centre forward, <laughs> the ball would come up to you, you bounce it to Lee and you just run in the box trying to get it Come on, Lee, Because Lee would just, he wasn't the quickest but he could manoeuvre the ball. He could manoeuvre it. You don't have to be the quickest. John Robertson at Nottingham Forest for all you old people. He didn't... <laughs> I watched him. He, he didn't He didn't sprint past people, but what he did, he could just shift it to one side and put a cross in. Lee could shift it either side, put a cross in, or have a shot. And he was very good, excellent like that, because he had the skill and the touch to do that. Now, not every player is... like I'm not... You would admit you're not like a Ryan Giggs could just knock it and... Run now. Yeah, no, it was like that's it but he had the skill just to 
More like a Weggerly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He had like a, good enough. Well, yeah, yeah but that's good enough. <laughs> but Lee was like excellent at, you know, bounce off him, get in the box, and he'd deliver a cross, and his crossing was excellent. His free kicks, his set pieces were good. And it's just unfortunate that like, you, you got sort of a knee injury quite, like, quite young. Yeah. Yeah, so. But forgetting that, what is each other's worst habits? Forget all the nice knees. Let's get into the... I don't know. I don't know. Just They're not married. Yeah. <laughs> well, they must have... I mean, that, that squad were Holloway. We didn't live quite... together. No. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, who, who, would, who was your best <laughs> roommates and your worst roommates then, would you say? Who did you room with? Um, I roomed with a few people. Jamie Curran and I roomed with. He was quite yeah. good, actually. The worst one I ever had was at Watford called Lloyd Doyle, his name was. You might have heard of him. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, yeah. Against us yeah. a bit. Yeah. His tongue's longer than that pint. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> how do you know that? How do you know that? I'll tell you how I know, because he used to snore in the bedroom, and as he used to snore, his tongue used to flap. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be like a snore, and then a flap, snore, and then a flap. And one night, I had to go and sleep in the bath, because it was that bad. I took my pillow and my blanket in the bath. How did you play the next day? I can't remember. I don't know. Decent, I suppose. Yeah. I'd loads of, I'd, that era I was always with Birchie, and you know, it was good fun to be fair, just yeah, just talking naps, listening to nonsense and talking nonsense. <laughs> we actually it was always never like a moody it was never a moody one. I'm just trying to think who was my um I used to share with Bradley Allen when I first got in the team and then it's a weird one because you know, it's you sh- you get so used to staying overnight on a Friday, it's just just getting just lying in your bed. It's a bit it's bad. When you travel, it's bad. I used to, I'd miss it now a little could, bit. Like you used to like want a room with a certain person, and then like if so, I remember what sometimes some managers say, no, I want to mix the rooms up, and you're like, yeah. oh, don't mix the rooms up. <laughs> like I yeah, might be with a snorer or someone like boring or something. I didn't just, agree with that because you want a room with someone and. Then, People, some certain players get on better than certain mm. other players, and if they say, "Oh, you're rumoured him, you're rumoured him," and you're like, "Well, I'm not really. I'm just going to sit there and not talk." <laughs> I remember I, I roomed with Paul Furlong once, and all he did was put his headphones on and watch a DVD. I was like, <laughs> first, was <just>, hello, <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Just like lying there watching these dinners, just the worst. Thing. He obviously didn't like to hear me. <laughs> my, my first ever one was Steve Palmer, who we ended up signing. I was 17 at Watford and I travelled with the first team and Graham Taylor put me with him because he was the most experienced. And um, he opened the window for the whole night and I was freezing my nuts off. But I didn't want to say nothing because, you know, I was a young kid, so I didn't want to, like, get up and close the window in case he wanted it open. So I just froze for well. nine hours in bed. Like... <laughs> I just uh, you're like this one. God rest his star, Alan McDonald. But um, I remember we went to uh, a match, and uh, uh, we went to. He took me, him and Mark Hately took me to a Glasgow Rangers Celtic match, and I remember Mark Hately had to share with him, and he said it was the worst experience of his life. He said the place, he said the room, all he could see every half an hour was a red dot. <laughs> and smoke everywhere. <laughs> Every half hour he'd be smoking. And then, then I went to Dave Bards. Bards, because he's just constantly wake up in the middle of the night and it just see a red dot in the air. <laughs> <laughs> he used to smoke at half time. When, yeah, he was, yeah. when he was assistant, you'd come in at half time and Mac would be having a fag in the toilet. He used to, be, he used to do that when he was playing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> Bruce Roy, Bruce Riot came in when he was in charge and he, and he, he smelt the smoke. And he went, woe betide, this is how um, Bruce Riott was like a head mother. Woe betide the man I find smoking in these, in these, in these toilets. And we were all looking at Macca giving out, think you're, you've been rumbled, mate. And it was like, yeah, he used to have a, a cigarette at half time. It was just unbelievable. Um, Ian, Ho- like Ian Holloway seemed like, like really popular with the players. Have you got, uh, did he ever play a prank on the squad? Or have you, if not, um, what's like, the funniest memory you have from Holloway's reign in charge? <laughs> I'm not saying that one. <laughs> You're thinking on. the same one. There's no that. one listening. I tell you what, I will say it. Do you remember that one? No, on. The one before Hull. The one before Hull. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember when, he, when we lost? They're now conferring about whether oh, yeah. whether they yeah, can yeah, tell the story. Oh, you say it. And Lee has been nominated oh, to say bit, it. Oh, and it's Bam McGuskey. Very rude. Yeah. Better not. No. Very rude. Okay. I tell, tell you what. Tell us I think it'd be better. 
Uh, well, we'll tell you all afterwards. Obviously, you'll both keep your fans. There's not, there's, there's, uh, not many keep your fans in the team now, if any, although Sebastian Polter gives it a good go on Twitter. Um, I was just going to say, who is your favourite QPR player, each of you? At the moment? Oh, no, of all, all time. I mean, when you're growing up. Well, let's oh. do both. All time and at the moment. At the moment, at the moment Ali Falling, because yeah. he's, he's my pal and I enjoy watching him play. No, we love Been so unfortunate with injuries, but what a talent. And uh, I just hope he gets more of a chance to get his, get his fitness going and I think he could do well for us again next year if, he's, if he gets the uh, option to. So, yeah. Ali, yeah. 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 Uh, and all time, mm, oh, from the clips I see, it's Rodney Marsh for me. Controversial, but that's it. That's that You've just devoted the room. Well, no, I mean, everyone says Stanley to me, but from all the clips I've seen, Rodney's just too good. Too good. <laughs> Why is that controversial? No, no, it's not, not, not good to see. Oh, see, for me, growing up, Trevor Sinclair was, was my man. Yeah. Yeah. Kev? Uh, now, I suppose I, I like Ali Fallin. I think he's a really good passer. I like Clint Hill because. He sort of comes in from the cold and he comes in and then it's like it's pretty much the best defender for me when he comes in. And then he goes out again and he's, they must put him in the ice chamber for a couple of months <laughs> and then they bring him out again when they need him and he always steps up to the plate. So he's been good all time. I mean, I, I never actually got, obviously we never got to see Rodney or Stan. I mean, I remember actually watching Stan play for Brentford. I think because my dad used to say, well, Stan's playing at Brentford. Let's go, if QPR were too far away, we'll go and watch Stan. Jerry Francis, obviously, I think, you know, to, to actually, you know, when I was a kid and he was my first manager, as a, when I turned up at QPR at 16 and he was the manager, he was like very in awe of him. And then he, you'd, he'd come and join in, join in and train and he was still an excellent player. He was, he was like really good. But then I was sort of, my time was the 80s and players like John Byrne, Bannister, Stainrod, Clive Allen, Terry Fennick, those sort of players, and then sort of went through, and Alan McDonald, and then Steve Morrill. Yeah. <laughs> Who were I mean, you in the Ray, playground? Ray, Wil Ray Wilkins was just Wegley. He's mentioned it. That there were so many. I used to love Wegley when I was like 13, 14. Ray Wilkins was probably the best player I ever played with or trained with. He was just couldn't really run, but his just his passing, his vision, his attitude was just brilliant Les Ferdinand it was great to play up front with him was just an awesome centre forward I, w I wouldn't pick out one I'm more sort of you know you're talking about 80s 90s that, that sort of type there's so many we have so many good players I probably missed out a few but I'm not going to pick out one I'd love to get Stainrod on the podcast to be fair yeah it would be good and Ga a... Gary Bannister is definitely a must for next season uh, anybody here want to ask a question to the guys. Yes. When you get a bad injury, yeah, you, like you, your injury at Portsmouth, when you know, that broke my heart, you got that. Broke my knee. <laughs> <laughs> when you come back to play, how much is it to play on your mind? It did a lot because. So, just let me repeat the question okay. so they can hear it. It was when you get a bad injury, um, how much does that play on your mind when you come back? Yeah, massively because you're you're very you're very wary of um, of getting a tackle and and once once you get that tackle again or first tackle and you you can come through it you're like on top of the you're on top of the moon you're like yeah I'll come through that so you're always sort of worried but yeah definitely you don't like you're training for like six, well when I come back I was training for six or seven weeks. But it, it's nothing like a match. As soon as you get whacked in a match, it's, like, it's a lot different. And uh, and it can give you a bit of a shock. So, yeah, I was always aware as time goes on, you just you just get on with it again. Hi, 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 Kev. Uh, hi, Lee. Um, as two legends and so QPR supporters as well, um, I was just wondering... Um, as uh, the ground issue, uh, we hear so many stories about um, we're getting the ground, we're not getting the ground, we're getting a training ground, we're not getting a training ground. 
Uh, talking about Loftus Road, my, I would like to know from both of you, as supporters and legends, what do you actually feel about um, losing Loftus Road as our base all our life? And, and do you think that we could fill a 40,000 stadium? Um, Be honest. Probably not. 40,000, probably not. Um, it's a difficult one because moving forward, we probably do need to go and get, new, get a new stadium because everyone else has done it, apart from us, really, at the minute. Um, your Southamptons, Leicesters, all them sort of teams. Um, but we do, we, we know, obviously, what, what the atmosphere is like down there when we're going. And for, for as a fan, as supporters, it'd be difficult to leave there. Very difficult. I think we all know that. But I think if we're brutally honest and the club going forward, if you know we do get back up into the Premiership, I think it's it's a foregone conclusion we're going to need a new ground. So I th think it's something we just have to come to terms with. We're going to lose a little bit of that that atmosphere, but I think in the end it's down to us and, and you guys as supporters to when it does eventually happen to make the atmosphere as, as similar as it was. That's all we can do. Kev, you yeah. said yourself on Twitter today that you love Loftus Road. So how do you feel about the prospect of the club moving at some point? I understand uh, progress and, and this, that and the other. I just would like to ask anyone who's in charge, why can't, why can't, we, put, why can't we put another like, level on the Ellerslie Road? Why can't we buy the houses? Surely the houses can be bought. People say, that's oh, not possible. Why not? Why can't it be possible? Put another 7,000, get 25,000 seater at QPR. Why not? At Loftus Road in West London. I think that's a possibility. Why not? I don't think there's no reason why we can't. Why? I, I love Loftus Road. We all do. And, and I understand. And if that can't happen, I think that should be the first point of, uh, of view is can we extend the school end? Surely we can buy the school behind. Surely we can extend um, uh, Ellerslie Road. Why not? Why not? I don't know. Is it, uh, is, it about, is it about is it about a housing deal or is it about QPR? I, I'm a bit... I don't think it's about us so much now. I mean, we've got to think about the new breed of supporters coming through. Like, my, when I finally have kids, I want, you know, in, when they get to, you know, 10, 11, I'm going to start taking them to football and they know where they're going. They're going to need to be, where everyone else is doing it, we're going to need to, to be up there with them and doing the same thing. We do, no one's going to like it, but that's what we're going to have to do, unfortunately. That's, that's my opinion on it. I'm not sure, what Danny got here, I'm not sure what Lee was saying about, about, this, about this, but... But I, I, I don't want in, QPR uh, to come out of West London. Oh, like, no, no, definitely not. There's, there's sites where we can stay there. There, mm. there definitely is. But I just think if we're going to move forward and be a, uh, an established premiership side um, in years to come, I'm not talking, you know, in the next four or five years, I mean, like, you know, future, future. We need a new, we need a new ground. We do need a new ground. Sandy. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Um, I was just wondering um, if you could tell us who your favourite manager that you played under, preferably QPR manager, but who would you say would be your best manager you played under? I go, uh, well, I always go on um, <laughs> when I played my best football, which has been a bit selfish because uh, when you play your best football, I mean, I, I, my first manager was uh, Jerry Francis. I played some good stuff and then Ray Wilkins took over and I played some, you know, really good stuff under him. And then QPR would be Ian Holloway. It would be, be between Ian Holloway and, and Ray Wilkins, I'd say. And is that because they brought the best out in you? Yeah, I mean, uh, they both had a lot of faith in me. So once you get that sort of faith from a manager, it gives you a lot of confidence. So, you know, when you're like, as a player, you're thinking, if you have a bad game, you're going to get dropped. You're like nervous. But I, I remember when Ray Wilkins first came in, and I remember he, he sort of said to another member of staff, we, he, he trained us, we were playing Leeds on the Saturday, and he, tra and, and he said to someone, yeah, Kevin's been poor in training. And I'm like thinking, well, I, I don't think I'm going to play. And we, and we ended up, I ended up playing, and I played really well, scored, I set up two for Les, we won 3-1 or 3-0 against Leeds. And 
I was just obviously like thinking, right, that's my chance. I'm going to play the next game. And once you get that momentum, it's brilliant. And with Ian Holloway, yeah, what we talked about before, team spirit and, and all that, he was at that stage of his career, he was, he was brilliant. He was brilliant for me and he was brilliant for a lot of players as well. Can I ask a stupid right. question? Hang on, Lee hasn't answered. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> no obviously, Ollie was, you know, for, for me, 21-year-old signing for them. Just things like I had to go to court one day and he turned up in a cab and picked me up and went with me. Just things like that, you know, they, showing that they care. Man management, stuff that's, like that's that. That's different because I had to go to court with Ollie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? That's what we yeah. do. We all go to court with each other. It's wicked. <laughs> Sorry, Lee, then, for to jumping in. I do apologise. Lee, in, in, in your time at Rangers, um, be honest, and you look at the squad now, do you kind of look at the players we have yourself, Kevin, Gareth Ainsworth, all them sort of players that. Is it that togetherness, do you reckon, in the squad now? Will we ever get that again with local lads? And I oh know Gareth is not local. But do you know what I mean? It's, it's, there, there was a real togetherness then. That, that was a proper hashtag. Yeah, we obviously haven't got it now. Um, obviously. But yeah, we can get it. We can get it. And that all depends on the manager. That's how important they are. People think it's, you know, let's just pick a team and out you go. It's every, it's every little thing they do. Is down to the team, the team morale, the team spirit, the way you play, you're attacking, you're defending, how are you setting your team up, how do you manage your players? It's such a huge job, and we've we've been at Rangers where we had probably the best at doing it. I mean, on a on like we've already mentioned the low budget, the f the fact that Jimmy's coming in, he's got a good owner, obviously a new uh, director of football which we we needed, and obviously everyone's like few about that because it was bad before. I mean, the things that this club have done in the past five years in that sense has been just ridiculous, embarrassing. He's come in, thank God, that's going to change. And Jimmy's coming in. And like I've said before, he's the type of manager, these, these players that he signs, they're going to want to play for him. And I think he will get that spirit back at the club. Um, but like I said, we need to give him time. So let's not let's not be too hasty and jump on his back because next season might not be great either. But we just need to. It's going to take time to build it. Um, I've got a question about the, the crowd. We just touched on this earlier on. Is it the players' job to get the crowd going, or is it the crowd's job to get the players going? <laughs> there's always, there was always a, a conversation in the change room, and Ian Holloway and Kenny Jackett was there, and they always sort of said, you know, it goes both ways. You put a tackle in in the first 30 seconds, 40 seconds, the crowd get going. So it's a bit of both, really. Once the if the crowd's not going up, you've got to get them going. So how, how do you do that? What, well, do, is it with tackles? Is it with well, like... We, I remember we played against uh, Wigan and we said to Gareth Ainsworth, did you play that game, Gareth? We said to Gareth Ainsworth, Gareth, I was taking centre, I said, Gareth, I'm going to ping that ball on Leighton Bain's head and you're going to go and smash him. <laughs> <laughs> but fairly and he did and he concussed him <laughs> and it got everyone going and they, it did didn't get did. him going but the only problem was he didn't elbow him or it wasn't anything dirty he just you know Gareth was a strong a strong bloke yeah. we chipped it up onto the, uh, his left half and Gareth was like a raging bull just <laughs> clean, cleaned him out he got taken off and then the crowd were going. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of, it always is a bit of both because sometimes the fans are up for uh, games, you know, derby games, you don't have to get them going. It just happens. But there's, there's other games when, there's always the tough games for QPR, when I played for QPR, was the teams you're expected to beat because the fans are a little bit, oh, we should beat these. And that's the hardest games. Lee, can't let you go without asking you about the signing on fee story. There's, over the years, there's been a few sort of tales have cropped up about it. In front of us, in front of the live audience, explain the story of what happened with the signing on fee. Well, the story goes a little bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> so Johnny Palladini rings me up one day and says, right, I'm going to Scott Races, shall we go? I said, yeah, let's go. We get in the van, down there we go with my agent. We get on it, we get pissed. Johnny says to me, Fulham have come in for you, but I don't want to sell you. I'm going to sell you because we need the dough. So I get sold. They ring back up and say, um, Lee, we love you to sign. Johnny's just haggling over a couple of million quid, but we really want you. 
can we do it? I rung Gianni up and said, what's the problem? He said, they're not paying enough money. The fans will kill me if I sell you for two and a half million. I said, he said, we've got to give what for 15%. We've got to give you 10%. I said, keep my 10% uh, without help. He said, let's do it. Done. Brilliant. Short version. You sound like a man who's told that story a lot. But it's, it's, it's um, absolutely true then. It's all 100% true. You, you, yep. you gave back your time. I, mean. I think, well, I think the, the fee itself would have been enough to keep the club going for a bit. Um, you know, we were massively in debt at the time. But I think that would probably kept us going for a month or something. What more than that. But, um, yeah, so my, my little bit probably didn't do anything. But it just felt like the right thing. Yeah. Um, so if in a few years you're skint and we're solvent, are you going to come knocking on the door of Loftus Road or wherever we are and uh, sure. any chance Yeah, well, like right? I've said, I'm in the Crown and Scepter on Saturday, <laughs> yeah. so... Yeah. You're buying everyone I'll buy a Jager. I'll buy a Jager. Well, yeah. I'm back. Okay, um, thank you very much for your time. I want to finish off by asking you both um, about your predictions for next season, what you think will happen, what you want to see happen as fans, and start with... Lee? Uh, we've got to aim for the playoffs. Um, whether we get there or not, I'm not entirely convinced. Um, depending on the summer activity, who we bring in, who we, we sell. Um, but I think every team in the championship, when the season starts, I mean, you look at the teams that are below us at the minute, you've got Wolves, Blackburn, Reading, Forest, they're big clubs and they're all below us. They might have played some better football than us but at the end of the day the league table don't know they're still below us they're going to be coming for it strong as well um, but we have to aim for the playoffs simple Kev yeah always always when you start a season that's what you aim for is to try and get promoted If unless you're a team that's coming uh, coming up you're just thinking about survival but all depends on the summer uh, recruitment I always I keep talking about it you've got to get the right players in Last season, I don't think we got the right players in. It showed this season. We, I think we signed 13 players. They still, for me, I've got a lot to do in a QPR shirt. Hopefully, we can get it right uh, in the summer because at the end of the day, what, what the fans want and what we all want is to see QPR doing well. We want to be entertained. We want to see, we want to come home from a match watching QPR, three points, or thinking, well, the team really had a go there unlucky not to win we got a draw and they battled well that's all we want but you know always got to aim for the playoffs it all depends I, I really do think what kind of what kind of players we bring in and I think if you look at look at every team that's near the top of the table in any league they've always got a goal scorer and we need to sign someone who can get 15 to 20 20 pardon well, and play two up front, I, I mean, I think, I th you know, I, I think that's an option, especially at Loftus Road because the pitch is so tight. You don't really need that ma extra man in midfield because you can bypass it. The year we got promoted against uh, with Neil Warnock, people say it was just Helgeson up front, but Tarap had a free roll. We went long to, to Helgeson and then the ball dropped to the players up front and the players up front were that good. Tarap that season was phenomenal. Mackie was excellent. They could score goals and they could do the business in the last third. But if that's, I, I'm not sure which way Jimmy wants to play, one up front, two up front. But I think sometimes you've got to be flexible. You've got to have a plan A and a plan B. And uh, against certain teams, you play one up front. And certain, uh, if they're really good in midfield, you pack the midfield out. So, but hey, got to go home in a minute. Can't talk about it all night. <laughs> <laughs> but no, playoffs and definitely needs some goal scorers. Definitely. Right. This is the end of the podcast, chaps. I'm sorry. Um, Lee and Kevin, seriously, you come from a QPR generation when we had nothing but hope and you gave us dreams. We cannot thank you enough for the dreams you both gave us as QPR fans. Seriously, people, these guys played for our club, they support our club, and they're part of our history. Please thank them. <laughs> But also, can I just also thank every single one of you that download our pubs, podcast, I get the words out, every week, because without you, we're nothing. And we're so thankful that you 
listen to us talk rubbish week after week, no matter how bad the season is, thank you so much and please keep supporting us because we need you guys and thanks for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Yeah.